Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Thanks for watching Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage Vault Series. The Vault Series is a series of interviews that we shot starting back in 2004, two years before the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum opened to the public. If you like what you see, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Thanks for watching. Today's clip is with LA session bass guitarist. He's probably played on more hit pop records than any other bass player, Joe Osborne. I'm Joe Osborne from Shreveport, Louisiana. Joe, when did you start playing uh, guitar or bass or what did you start playing first? Well, I was originally a guitar player, uh, not a great one. So I started playing bass in uh, about 1959 working with a country band, a uh, guy named Bob Lewin, and uh, playing guitar with uh, the other guitar player. We didn't have a bass player. The other guitar player was Roy Buchanan. Everybody knows who that is. So we decided one of us had to play bass, and Roy was a much better guitar player than I was, so the next night I was the bass player. Went down to the local music store and bought a, bought a bass. Okay. And it was a, uh, a precision bay, Fender Precision. So that's all there was at the time. And um, the in, in say, about a year and a half later, uh, I went to work with Ricky Nelson through my friend James Burton. He saw me uh, playing at a club in in Shreveport. Well, we're both from Shreveport, James and I went to school together. And uh, told me about the, uh, Ricky's putting the band back together and uh, he's going to recommend me uh, for the bass player. I've been playing bass for about a year and a half. And so that's how I wound up in, uh, in L.A. So you don't have been playing bass for a year and a half? How long had you been playing guitar all together? Oh, four or five years maybe. Did you ever have any formal lessons? No, I never had any formal lessons. Just uh, learn from whoever you're playing with. Did you ever have any lessons? I mean, like, or did you just like do it all by ear, or just say, or you see somebody and go, "How'd you do that?" or something? Yeah. You know? Yeah, just learned everything by ear, like most of us, most of us did at the time. Yeah. Did you eventually learn how to read music? Yeah, uh, I was I was already starting to do a lot of recording sessions in L.A., just all head arrangements, and uh, my friend Tommy Tedesco started to work with him quite a bit, and he's one of the best readers there ever was. And he told me, he said, you know, when you get busy, you're really working hard because you got to come up with these parts and you got to understand what somebody needs and all that. He said, if you learn how to read, it works on a double. You get all the trash sessions. And that to him, that was the one where you go in and read the part, you don't have to think, you just do that, grab the money and run. Well, you know, I thought if somebody's that, is that interested in, in what I'm doing and uh, trying to advise me, somebody's been there and they know what they're talking about. Uh, that's what I bought a base book beginner's bass book and uh, learn the basics just where the notes were and uh, what they all meant and went from there and uh, most of most of my learning uh, to read was actually on sessions with the rangers that would always write a part but it was okay if you didn't play it so i'd go in and and look at it and try to play exactly what they wrote and then so if it got too hard, I'd go to the chord symbol and just play something. And uh, Tommy was right. Um, what were some of the arrangers that you worked with? The arrangers, uh, however many, uh, Henry Mancini, Hugo Montenegro, those type, those types. Then, then they were just uh, they, they mostly they were doing their own own things actually they weren't like freelance arrangers like uh, uh, what's his name uh, Al Capps 
Ernie Freeman, Jack, people like that. Jack, Jack Nietzsche? I uh, worked with Jack Nietzsche some. Uh, you give me some more names, I can, I can <laughs> remember. <laughs> um, well, um, what about producers? Who are some of your favorite producers to work with? Uh, my favorite producers were Lou Adler and uh, Bone Tow. Worked a lot with Jimmy Bowen. Uh, what made them really special, like some some producers didn't have this talent, they knew they knew what group of musicians to put together that would make the magic and uh, they'd put them in there with the song and the artist and leave them alone. Where a lot of producers thought somehow that if, if they weren't constantly saying something about what you should do or how to play that they weren't producing and they just totally missed it. Who was that group of musicians that you felt the magic happen with? Well, you know, Hal Blaine and Larry Nectel, Tommy Tedesco. We showed up a lot together, you know, and we weren't a band, you know. Uh, we were all freelance, just got called individually for the sessions. But many, many times, most of the time, uh, would be that group. And uh, that was sure a lot of magic. Don Randy? Worked a lot with Don Randy, uh, Mike Melvoin. Earl? Worked some with Earl. I didn't work a lot with Earl. But I did see, I saw him quite often. But most of it was Hal Blaine, Jimmy Gordon, John Guerin was the bulk of it. And um, then that, so that covered... Sinatra, Dean Martin, Mamas and Papas, Padre and the Raiders, Fifth Dimension. I mean, that was, that's just a, such a huge variety of going from one end of the spectrum to the other. Oh, that was what was so wonderful about that time in music is, is there were so many different types of music. You know, it wasn't just one, one thing or one sounding thing. It was just everything from mamas and papas to uh, carpenters, you know, by contrast. That, uh, and then here comes Jimmy Webb doing uh, semi-classical. And all that, all that worked. And, and all hit at the same time. And, uh, of course, you saw Glenn Campbell go from a studio player to all the way to be a movie star. Oh yeah, well I, I knew Glenn before he, he got even busy in the studio. We were both doing demo sessions for uh, grocery money and uh, started to get busy about the same time. And then we worked, we worked that way a lot together and then when he started doing his own, uh, own record deal, uh, I, I was just, I was there on that with him too. So I did, uh, most of what he did. I guess I did about everything he did until I left L.A. For moved to Nashville. I was like starting a whole new career. Did actually more more number one records in Nashville than I did in L.A. I don't know whether that's because country number ones are easier to come by or something. I don't know. Probably about a hundred number ones in Nashville. How many in L.A.? How many number ones in L.A.? I, I, can, I can count for sure about 20 number ones. Uh, Hal says, uh, I, I got, well, I got a list of about 200 top 40. Hal said it's got to be a lot more than that. Well, there are a lot that I suspect maybe, but if I wasn't absolutely sure that I did the record, I don't, I don't claim it. Uh, so, but there's at least 200. And that that was a period starting from, um, what, 61 maybe, you say? Yeah, well, I went to work with Ricky in 1960, and then in 61, 
a traveling man hit. Turned out to be the biggest record of his career. So uh, I was, actually, I, I was on the number one record right away when I got there. Well, another thing to be said about that era is uh, these uh, oldies radio stations are very successful playing all those songs that still sound good today and are still fun to hear. Yeah, and I, don't, and I really don't think that there's ever going to be a time repeated like that again. I don't think it will be repeated. Uh, for what reason, I don't know. Uh, well, one reason that's obvious is uh, a lot of labels don't want anything different except what they have, they follow their format, and it all sounds the same to me, and it's pretty boring, but uh, uh, at that time, anything, if you came up with something different, you could get a record deal. So. Um, what's your thoughts on the way that, that people record today? Um, a, a big part of what made the records sound the way they did uh, was the way, the way we had to play, and, and the technology. We didn't have the digital and the synthesizers. It's all analog. And, and the multi-tracks. Uh, like the Mamas and the Papas uh, records were recorded on three-track. They would have two three-track machines. So you put, you fill up three tracks on the first machine, then transfer that to the other to open up tracks to put more things on. Well, going down, you're going to have bass and drums at least on one track. Sometimes keyboard and guitars on one track going down. So that means you, you have to play the song all the way through with no, because you can't fix mistakes like you can now everybody with their own track. If you make a mistake, you can go back and fix that. That wasn't the case. So everybody's got to concentrate, get their head into the song and play the song all the way through now that added a sound and, a, and an energy that we don't get today. We got lazy with the technology. Well, I can fix my part later. That's a lot of baloney, man. So that's what happened. Uh, that's one of the big differences in what ha uh, the sound and the feel of those records. Um, what you said earlier about producers, uh, Billy Sherrill in Nashville, I asked Billy one time, I said, Billy, what in your opinion makes a good producer? And he goes, and he said, well, uh, to me, the producer's job is to find the right song for the right artist and pull the performance out of the artist. Exactly. The producers that knew who to call and the combination of musicians to put together in the studio that would help, that actually help make the song better. And the producer knows who to leave alone and who to, who to let contribute themselves. Um, I think a lot of, and not to take away from the songwriters at all, because of, and that's another thing, some of the songs um, lyrically and melodically are just, are, are timeless. But I think that the, the caliber of players that were available at that time um, took some average songs and honestly a lot of the pop records from that era and today still I can't tell you the lyrics to them so I can't honestly say it was the whole lyrical content that made me like the song it's definitely the the music and, and maybe the hook line that carries it um, so I think you guys were responsible for making a lot of so-so songs hit records Played on a lot of songs that that uh, were, that, was, that weren't good, and uh, so so we, you think, well, what what's the guy doing this for? But with with our the attitude of these uh, the musicians uh, that were doing all the hit records, the, there is no such thing as not play your best for every. Thing, no matter what, you don't like the artist, you don't like the song. Okay, now give it everything you've got, and that had a lot to do with uh, whether those songs hit or not. I believe. Um, it's no telling. I mean, really, no telling how many sessions you've done. 
in, in his usual session, well, in Nashville anyway, a lot of times you'd at least try to get minimum of two, usually three song basic tracks. As uh, the majority of people would book, uh, book the band in three hour session and expect to, uh, I think at that time the union allowed four songs. For a three-hour session, it went up went to six, I believe, later, and so people would try to cram that in, and it worked for a lot of people. It, Snuffy Garrett's a good example. He he'd do an album in two sessions, and uh, like, like a twelve-song album in two sessions, at six hours, and he got hit records doing it that way. But, but uh, then there were people like the Mamas and the Papas, John Phillips would bring a song in and we'd work from two o'clock in the afternoon to four in the morning just to get the track on one song. So. Well, would, that be, uh, would that be John or would that be Lou? That would be John. See, Lou was one of those that put the people out there and let them work. And he'd, he'd come in now and then and want to know, if, are you ready to do one? <laughs> you know? So, um, let's say on the, uh, I guess California Dreaming was probably your first session with him, right? California Dreaming was the first session. Uh, was that the first song? I, I, I believe it was. I, I think Lou had just signed them and uh, brought, brought them in one morning at Western Studio in, there in L.A. And uh, it seemed like he he would he wanted to try this song with this new group, and it turned out to be the record California Dreaming. And who was playing the uh, twelve string guitar on that? Was that John or was that a session guy? Oh, John played twelve string on the sessions. He had a great a great right hand. Now he he played mostly rhythm. The things where there's that solid twelve string rhythm, that's John. And so Tommy Tedesco was playing acoustic guitar on most all those Moms and Papa sessions? Some, I don't know most, but uh, he was there, so. Did you ever feel like the well had run dry as far as creativity on your part goes? Uh, I, I, never, I never felt uh, any, any problem with being creative if there was anything to be creative for. That, that would sometimes be the problem if the song just didn't give you anything. Uh, and I really believe that there, there, kids will ask, how, how did you think of all those things to play? You know, so the song will tell you what to play. How did you land on a Fender jazz bass as your, as your main instrument? Uh, uh, working with Ricky, that one uh, traveling man hit, uh, they had booked a world tour and Fender wanted all their new stuff to go on that tour. The jazz bass wasn't even in the store yet. So uh, they gave me and James new stuff and there was the jazz bass. And that's the one that you've kept all these years? Yeah, it's on all those records. And, um, and I heard that you kept the same set of strings on the bass for like 14 years or something. Yeah, I had to sit on there for 17 years, uh, playing at the Whiskey Go Go. Uh, I changed strings. I don't know why I did, but uh, I didn't change strings again for 17 years. I got in a trap because they started to wear in and, and get a dullness about them that was really good instead of that new twanginess. And I would try to change, I would get a new set of strings, put them on there and it just sounded really ugly. I wound up putting the old ones back on. I tried that three or four times. Put the old ones back on. And it's, they just started to sound so different from new strings then it was, it was really a problem to even try to change. That kind of became your sound, or yeah. Uh, were they flat wound, or they flat wound uh, Labella strings made for Fender. See, they, and and they, they weren't the choices of strings back then either. It was like a, 
Labella had strings. Uh, you go and get a set of bass strings. They said, "What kind of bass?" Fender. Okay. It had had a list of uh, bases on the front of the package, and if you got a Fender, and it's check marked by a Fender, that's your string. No different gauges. Uh, you know, nothing. That was uh, that was your string. Could you not get a? Could you not let you get some old strings off of somebody else's? Bass or have some, you know, or just have another bass and wear some out, maybe? No, I tried using old strings that uh, Lee, Leland Slaughter gave me a set of strings one time. I was in Nashville that, that he'd uh, taken off. He'd got some new strings. He, <laughs> he handed me those. Uh, but it wasn't the same somehow. It didn't sound, that didn't work. And I don't know why it didn't work. Did you ever modify your bass any? No, the bass was just like it was. It's, and what no mod not, didn't modify anything. Well, see, I didn't know anything about playing the bass or what it's supposed to sound like. I was a guitar player. Next day, I was a bass player. That's why I kept the pick because that's what felt right. And I, I got a lot of flack about that from bass players. And everybody with a with an electric bass was trying to make it sound like they're upright. And playing with a pick with a lot of trouble on the amp was you can't do that. <laughs> well, if I can't do that, I might as well quit. Yeah. Uh, well, you know that's the thing that that's the difference between. I mean, look at uh, James Jamerson. You know, he's one <laughs> one finger. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And you see, I mean, if you're gonna be, you know, quote a blaze player, and you know the highbrows want to, you know, they want you to use all four or five, or whatever. Yeah, just play what you play how you feel it. Uh, my grandson picked up the bass. He turned out to be a wonderful bass player, playing around Freeport with bands. But uh, when he showed an interest, I handed him a pick. He tried that. He didn't like that right away. I said, "Play it what feels right to you. You don't have to do anything like I do it. Play what feels right to you." Um, so really, you, uh, really give credit to James Burton for, for bringing you into the recording industry? Well, he, he's absolutely directly responsible for me, uh, going to Los Angeles and, and working with Ricky. It's a perfect showcase to be seen and heard by record producers. So it wasn't long until I started getting the calls. How did um, how did being on national TV every week at that time how, how did that change your life uh, socially and economically too? Uh, oh, I didn't know if being by doing all that I didn't notice any big changes of anything really. Did you not get fan mail from from people seeing you on TV? No, no. Uh, I, I don't. I don't remember getting any fan mail until I started playing on some hit records with different people. And yeah, and the, que the one of the questions would be, "How do you get that sound?" And that's a pretty hard one to, to answer, you know. And okay, so amplification was Fender as well. Yeah, it was. I, had, I was playing the jazz bass through a Fender concert amp. That's that amp with four 10-inch speakers. And uh, I, I think at the time, that's the biggest down Fender had. Um, did you think those four tens gave you a, a, a help to contribute to that punchy sound as opposed to a big 15 or an 18 inch speaker? Yeah, that uh, concert amp. Also, it, it had an open back. And, and when the... Uh, they started closing that in, it, it changed the sound a lot. It, did, it, did, it wasn't as open a sound, it was airy, it, was just, it got thumpy to me. I didn't like that. So I don't know whether that was an effort to try to force you to sound like a bass, <laughs> you know. Did, um, did you, once you started doing the session work, did you stay off the road or did you, did you have a career on the road with anyone? I didn't go on the road much. Uh, 
especially when I got busy doing sessions. And if you're going to be a session player, you got to be there. You can't be going in and out of town because uh, uh, there's there's some loyalty there. Producers would wait for you, but but the biggest part of that, if you're not available, they call somebody else, and uh, if that works out, you're not going to get the next call. What about a favorite? performance of yours on record? Uh, some of the things I did with the Carpenters uh, really uh, define my bass playing. Some of the melodic things. Then the, my favorite rhythmic bass part was on the fifth dimension, uh, Let the Sunshine In. That was an incredible, that was just an incredible riff, all that, that was a, I think that was a large reason that song was such a, a great record. That was the Bones Howe producer, and uh, the, the part was written, that part wasn't written, but a part was written, uh, Bob Alcivar was the arranger on that. And, uh, we ran it down a few times, uh, playing the chart. Bones came out and said, can you guys just play more? When it goes into Let the Sun Shine In, can you play more? Okay. But he went back in the control room and that's all he said. He didn't hum any parts. He didn't just say, can you play more? So the very next take, that's what came out. Well, that's another good example of uh, producers that know he knew he had the band that could do whatever, and uh, so that's all he had to say.